Good morning. morning. It's great to be here. Glad you came up the hill this this, this morning to be here. I'm going to be, as you leave, I'm going to have some of the people back there hand you these sheets. It it says where all our worship points are tonight. There's there's nine of them uh, from individual homes of people who can't uh, come to worship anymore. Leo and Shirley Bartholomew, for instance. There's going to be a group going to their house and, and having worship tonight. They're all at different times because if we had to work it out with different places so I can't just read off the the times they're on this page please take it because uh, if you show up at certain times of course you'll be later or really early a couple of changes is is that st. Bernard's Chapel would not let us uh, do worship in their chapel they said if you're not mass you can't do worship here so we're gonna take those who signed up to go to st. Bernard's Chapel and you're gonna go down the street to the hospice house they're more than welcome uh, to let us do that so uh, if you signed up for that please go down there it's at 4 30 and then st bernard's villa uh, backed us up a little bit i don't know why just blame bill berry bill berry runs that place anyway 5 45 or so something like that they're gonna they're they're helping to bring the people in the lady's gonna be there to help start that so she's gonna be there at 5 30 get people in into that uh, they've got a great chapel there uh and so uh, if you're going to there it's gonna be more like 5 45 the service here will be the regular 5 30 time so there will be one here i don't want you to to go crazy like if if there's not someone here because there will be but there are nine places the times are all different take this sheet there's plenty for everybody if you're leading singing tonight uh, get song books to take with you uh, and it could be the new ones it could be the old ones uh, and bring them back okay bring them back by Wednesday night and also if you're at one of these that thinks you want to offer the Lord's Supper where you go like those who go to the Bartholomew's house it'd be cool to be able to have the Lord's Supper with them but maybe not everybody wants to do that but if you are going and you're the speaker at at one of these and you know who you are if you want to take the Lord's Supper be prepared for that guys we're taking worship to people who can't worship all the time and it counts every bit as if you were here it doesn't matter where you are it's what you're doing what you're engaging in and who you're addressing it to and so I hope that what you'll do is you'll look at this as like a service on your part even though you'll be engaged in worship as well so that's tonight Uh, please take advantage of one of those and and just have a strange worship service tonight somewhere okay that you're not used to trunk or treat is Wednesday night this is different And some of you are going to say, well, we don't come for this, or uh, we don't know what the worship would be like. It's going to be the most terrifying moments in the Bible is the devotional for Wednesday night, because it's (laughs) Halloween, right? So you've got to do something like that. It's it's not going to be a normal hour. It's going to be about 15 minutes to 20 minutes. We're going to do some singing out there. And we're hoping that some people who are coming to do trunk or treating will be here early enough to where they hear some of the things we say. Uh, I put an argument uh, about that in the bulletin. So just read that. And and here's the other thing I want to say about trunk or treating. Some of you are going to say, you know what? I don't want to decorate my trunk. That's too much trouble. Well, bring a, bring a seat because we're also calling it seat or treat. Not just trunk or treat. It's seat or treat. Because if you just bring your lawn chair and you've got candy, nobody will care that your lawn chair is not a trunk. You just bring candy. You decorate that lawn chair. If that decoration is just you sitting in it, you decorate that lawn chair. Just line it up. So we'll have cars and trunks here in the middle and we'll have a bunch of lawn chairs out here with people sitting there looking funny. And because even if you don't wear a mask, it is, you are a little odd looking, at least from here. And so that would be perfect, okay? So bring your seats if you don't. Don't miss this because you don't fix a trunk and don't miss it because it's not our normal Bible class time. This is an outreach effort. We've called it an outreach effort for a long time, but it's not really just handing candy. Today we got a message with the candy, okay? So that's Wednesday night. Night. Be there for that. And don't forget, next Sunday, Harding Concert Choir. I brag about this because, you know, Noah's in it, right? And so was Savannah for a time. I don't think she is now. Uh, but they're going to be here during class time. So come to early service or come to the regular service. But the Bible class in between, we all meet in here. And the Harding Concert Choir will put up, make a presentation. And then we'll have about 100 extra voices in our worship service. So it's going to be a rock in the house Sunday morning, next Sunday morning. I don't know if you can say that about worship because it's to God. That's irreverent. Sorry. We're going to sing really well next Sunday night with all those voices. We're in James chapter 4 if you'll be joining me uh, for that. Jesus loves me this I know. Jesus. 
Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. We're playing a game and you have to play it. If Simon says, you have to do it. If Simon doesn't say it, don't do it. It's Simon says. Simon says, hold up your right hand. Good. Keep it up there. Simon says, hold up your right hand while closing your left eye. Everything looks a little different, doesn't it? Simon says, hold up your right hand while closing your left eye and tapping your right foot. Billy, you're not doing this. Put your hand up. There you go. Everybody tapping your foot. All three of these things are some churches of Christ, so you shouldn't do any of them. And we're doing them all because Simon says. Okay, now stick out your tongue. Nobody did it. Good job. In the early service, Danny Wallace stuck his tongue out at me. And I wanted to take a picture because what elder does that in church? All right. Simon says, look at the person nearest you and say, howdy. Simon says, say the first five words of Jesus loves me. And Simon says, touch the index finger of your left hand over your nose, right over your right nostril. And keep it there. Now, with the other hand, wave at your neighbor. Simon didn't say that. This game, this game is annoying. It's annoying and you say, what are we doing playing a game like this at church? But listen, I can't, we can talk about submission all we want to, but what you've just done is you've shown and demonstrated what submission looks like. Submission is when you do something because someone else said it, not because you wanted to or thought about it. Submission is when you're willing to listen to someone else rather than yourself. And we've just practiced that. You've only done these things. Who in the world does this at church? We we only did it because Simon says. That's all. And I want you to know this. I'm calling for everybody to embrace submission for this week, just like God does every week when we gather. The secret to a Christian life is this principle right here. If we learn this, we learn the Christian life. Submission means doing what God wants, not what I want. And there you have the secret of the entire thing. And so those of you who've never responded to the gospel, let me tell you how you would do it. You would look at the word and hear what it says, and you realize I haven't been doing what the word says. Says. There's what God says and what I've been doing. And repentance is when I realize I've done, I'm going to make a change. I'm going to do what God wants. And then the first act of submission is when you allow yourself to be immersed in the waters of baptism. Nobody wants to do that. It's not a, something that everybody even preaches all the time. It's a lot of people just want to cut that out. But that's the first act of submission you do is joining with Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection. And then when you rise to walk a new life, the rest of your life is just continuing that submission. It's how you become a Christian. It's how you stay a Christian. It's how you end your life as a Christian, as you submit to God. I want you to think about your life over the last couple weeks. I want you to think about these words from God. God says, love and pray for your enemies. Have you done that? Submission. God says, be angry and do not sin. That's submission. Think about your life over the last couple of weeks. Have you been submitting? God says, let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building others up that it may meet their needs. Have you been doing that? That's submission. It requires two things. It requires knowing what God wants and doing what God wants. Both of them have to be together. Knowing is not enough. A lot of people think they pride themselves on, I know God's will. Problem is they don't do it, so it doesn't do you any good. There are some people who do things that are in God's will, but not because God said it. And that's not submission either. Submission requires both of these. And God's people have been called to this over all the centuries. I want you to think of Moses right before they enter the promise land. Moses gives these great speeches in the book of Deuteronomy and the last one says this. See I've set before you life and death. Life is doing the commands of God. Death is not doing the commands of God and I'm setting it before you. It's up to you to choose. You submit or not here in a couple weeks if you haven't done the early voting already you're going to be voting. Casting a vote for what you want. And God says here's, the here's what's at stake. You decide. Moses said it's before the people. Then his next follow, the, the next leader is Joshua. And there at the end of Joshua, he says, well, if it's, you know, too burdensome to serve God, choose you this day whom you'll serve, whether the gods be on the river or the gods in whose land you dwell in. But as for me and my house, you guys choose. You guys submit. You got to decide. And James, in the book of James, is fighting double-mindedness. People can't make up their mind because they feel strongly both ways. I kind of want what I want and I kind of want what God 
God wants, and I'm going to ride the fence. One other one I want you to notice is Elijah on Mount Carmel. Right before he has this competition, here's what Elijah says. He gathers all the people of Israel and he says, how long are you guys going to dance between two opinions? This word means dance. It means I want Baal now and I want Asherah now and I want a God now. And so they're doing this wonderful dance, right? Because they can't decide. God says, I want you to nail your foot to the floor. If it's Baal, serve Baal. If it's God, serve God. And what do the people say? Say it together. The people did not answer him a word. We can't decide. Oh, gee, decisions, decisions. And there's a lot of people even right now this morning sitting in the church building right now who just can't really decide if they want to serve God or they want to serve themselves in this world. It's called double-mindedness. And God says the solution to this is submit. Submission is hard, but it's the secret to the Christian life, and James acknowledges it. Join me at James chapter 4, which is well read a moment ago, very capably. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Submit to God. You need to decide. You need to decide once and for all, this is what I'm standing upon, and go out here and live your life on it. You've sung the songs, I am I no more. Did you hear that a minute ago? Did you hear yourself singing that? Anybody? Did you hear yourself singing that? That's called submission. I'm not calling the shots to my life anymore. You sang it a minute ago. Now what, what God's asking you is to go live it when you leave this building. Go down the hill and go back into your life and live that way. Don't just sing it with your lips and not say it with your life. The key is submission, and it's very difficult. Submission is the hardest thing we ever have to do. That's why it's the key to the Christian life. And I want to show you why it's hard. First of all, he says, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. Here's why. Because there's somebody working against you in this world. If it's just you and God, and we in the sanctity of our minds can make a decision about how we're going to live our lives, it's easy enough to make the right decision when you're sitting at your house with your coffee, and it's you and God at 630 in the morning. And you're going to say, you know, I can live my day for God. The problem is, as soon as you walk out the door of your house, you are living, interacting with other people, and Satan is coming at you in a barrage. You're online, and you're just doing your own, minding your own business, doing the email, and all of a sudden, here comes this unwanted, unasked for little ad. And all of a sudden, you're distracted. You didn't go there. It came to you. Satan subcontracts with this world and throws stuff at you. If Adam and Eve would have been in the garden alone, I think we'd still be in the garden. But who else showed up, church? The serpent showed up. And he started making them look at things when they didn't look at them before. And all of a sudden, you have an advertisement and a commercial for this tree with a very slick-selling salesman. And all of a sudden, you're listening to other voices. If it were just us, it'd be easy. It's not just us church Satan is alive and well and the thing is God wants us to know he's there but Satan couldn't care less whether you know he's there or not and there are plenty of believers who even deny his existence serves his purposes just perfectly it'd be easy if it was just us It'd be easy because you could go to, or you could see this trailer for a movie, and you could say, I want to watch that, and then you go online and you read all the, the nasty words and the scenes that are in it that you have no business watching, and you decide instantly, well, that looked interesting, but that's not where me, as a Christian in my life and my weaknesses, need to go. And that's great. You decide with God that day as you watch that report and that review, and you say, I'm not going to go to that movie. But Friday night comes, and you've got seven friends going with you, and there's a party of eight going to watch the movie, and all the other seven and want to see it. Now you've got a problem because you made up a decision in the resolve and the privacy of your minds by principle. I'm not going to see that movie, but can you tell seven friends who want to see it that you're not going to go if they go? Are you going to do that? All of a sudden, it's no longer a decision you make. We can't sit up here at the church on the hill and live our lives like this, obeying the will of God. We've got to go out in the real world and live them there. That's where it's lived. And Satan's going to attack us. I think about marriage this way. It requires two people to be devoted to each other. And let's say the wife really wants a spiritual home. And she wants to have spiritual exercises and be involved in spiritual things. But the husband doesn't. If that's the case, he's going to strangle it, isn't he? 
It would be easy if it was just us. It's not. Satan is here to defeat you. Submission's hard. Submission's hard because in chapter and verse 8 says, right after this, resist the devil, he flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Who does the moving first? Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Who does the moving first? You do. God doesn't come and drag you kicking and screaming into his kingdom. He doesn't do it. He lets it be a choice that you make, and he won't do this. Now, repeat this. I mean, I finish this. Objects in motion tend to stay in motion. Objects at rest tend to... Yeah, once you get in your lazy boy, it's hard to get out. That's what that means. And when you've decided, I'm going to live my life on my own, I'm not going to submit to God, it's very easy to stay there, isn't it? It's very easy to stay in that life and not do what God wants us to. And he says, if you want me drawn near to you, you've got to make the first move. You've got to be the one to get up and go toward God. That's just the way it is. You ever wonder in the, par the parable of the prodigal son why the father didn't run after the son? Why didn't he go in far country and drag him back? Why didn't he do this undercover thing and go and kidnap him and bring him back home? Why didn't he do it? The father never left. The father stayed at home. Why did he stay there? You know who the father is in the story, right? You know this. That's God. God does not go and drag you back to him where you should go. He lets you choose. He lets you practice your own free will. And if you want to spit in his face, I wish you were dead. Give me my money. I'm leaving. He will give you your money and let you act like he's dead. He will let you do it and he won't come dragging after you. And he won't come running after you and dragging you back against your will. So if you want him, you have to move. You have to show him you want him. There's a story in, Ex in Exodus, Genesis chapter 28, and you know the story of, of, J of Jacob seeing the ladder into heaven. He has this dream, and he's got his head as a pillow, as a rock. You remember? At the end of this dream, he puts these rocks together, and he pulls oil, oil on the top of it, and he makes this, this, this uh, obligation to God, this arrangement. Jacob made a vow, verse 20, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and he will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear, so I come again to my father's house in peace. As you know, he left with the conflict with his brother. Then the Lord shall be my God. This stone which I've set up for a pillar shall be God's house. And all that you give me, I'll give a tenth to you. This is a great deal for him. God's going to give him all these blessings. And he's just got to do a few things in response. He makes this arrangement in Genesis chapter 28. And it sounds really good and everything's great. It sounds like baptism. God, I'm going to give you my life. I'm going to work. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to submit to you all my life. And it's red hot and you're excited and you're devoted. But real life happens, doesn't it? By Genesis chapter 35, God comes knocking at the door. Next screen. Jacob, you need to go back to Bethel. He knew where Bethel was. He changed the name of the city based on his covenant with God. He changed the name. And now God says, uh, it's seven chapters later, and one of us has moved, and guess who it is? It's you, Jacob, and you've got to go back. You need to go back. And he gets his family together and they go back. This is the way God is. God says, you know what? I want you to submit to me, but I'm not going to make you. You've got to make the first move. You've got to be the one to make the decision to go back. The hardest step is the first one. Those of you who remember when people made responses a lot on Sunday mornings, this was before my time, when people would really grapple with their salvation on Sunday morning, they'd hold the back of that pew because the first step is the hardest one. You've got to, it's total, complete obedience. You know it's the right thing, but everything within you is afraid of the embarrassment or the shame or whatever. That first step's the hardest one, and it's all you. It's all you. God's not going to make you. He's not going to push you out there. Once you get out in the aisle and start coming down, you're going to have some people help you. But you've got to make the first move, and nobody can make you. Nobody can drag you. I remember when, my, when Noah was younger, he didn't want to drive at age 16. We had to make him drive because he sits at home, and he plays his video games, and that's his world. That's all he cares about. He knows if he gets his license, he has to run the honeydew things that I had to run. He knew his mom would say, could you run Abby here and there? And he thought, well, I don't have a license. I can't do it. Smart kid. Smart kid. But he also didn't want to go to youth events. Can you believe that? Preacher's kid not wanting to go to youth events? He didn't. And I didn't make him go to all of them because I don't think you should make him go to all of them necessarily. And he didn't have to go because he's a preacher's kid. I never said that. 
but it's good for him and it's the things that because mostly I was doing them so he you know kind of but as, as, as he was doing all that I, I would say you're gonna have to go I don't want to I, don't, I didn't I didn't say you had I, I didn't say you had to want to you're gonna have to go to some of these he always loved being at them. I noticed this. He loved being at them, and after it was over, he was glad he went. It's just getting there. It's all that stuff about getting there and leaving behind this stuff and going and being the first one to make that step. Guys, I'm going to tell you, you won't always feel great about making the right step, but when you know it's the right thing, you just need to do the right thing, and you start drawing near to God, you've got to make the first move. You've got to step out there and do the right thing. And no one can do it for you, God included. Notice in verse, uh, the second half of verse 8, he says, Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. I want you to wash those hands. There's things sticking to you that shouldn't be sticking to you. And there are things sticking to you that you can't come to God with. You can't come to God this way. You've got to wash some of this stuff off. Maybe you've got friends that you can't bring with you. If you're going to come close to God, you can't bring the friend with you because the friend's going to hang on to you on the other side and you're going to be used like a tug-of-war. And everything that's back there, maybe, maybe you got a new, maybe you signed up for cable just in the last couple of weeks and they put all these movie channels in there for free for a year. You might have to call them and say, you know what, I don't want that HBO at night. I, don't, I want you to cancel it, but it's free. I know it's free. I know it's free, but I don't need it in my house, so cut it off. But, but man, this is part of the pack. I'm telling you, I don't want it in my house. You might have to do that. Can you? There's some things that if you're going to draw near to God, you can't keep in your other hand. You just can't do it. When Jacob was told to go back to Bethel, made reference to this, I want you to notice what Jacob does. God says, oh, Jacob, you need to go back to Bethel because you've left me behind. The only one moving is you, and the only one who can get back is you. And this is what Jacob says. So Jacob puts his, he gets his family together for a family meeting. Anybody ever have a family meeting? It usually means somebody's done something wrong. He gets the family together and says, guys, we've come to, we have, I had every intention of leading this family spiritually, but there's some things that we need to go, we've got to go back and meet with God. But before we go back, notice what he says, put away the foreign gods. God didn't tell him there were foreign gods there. How did he know? He knew all along they were there. In chapter 28, he was like, God, I'm going to give you everything. You're going to be number one by Genesis chapter 35. He's let foreign gods come into his house, and he knew it. He just wasn't willing to disturb the kids. He wasn't willing to disturb his wife. He wasn't willing to uproot all the peace of his house. Oh, that'll be okay. I'll just kind of, I'll just kind of have a peace treaty with this little bit of sin in my life, and I'll just let it go. And we just let stuff go. We let stuff go and show up in our houses that have no business being in our houses. And when you decide to go back to God, you've got to get rid of it. And so he gets his family together and says, get rid of them, guys. We had a bar set up here when we first became Christians. And over time, we've been content to let it be here and think that we're giving God a bunch. I know dads who let their kids wear the most ridiculous, immodest stuff out of their house. And I'm going, I'm not looking at the kids saying, what's wrong with you? I'm looking at the dad saying, where have you been? Hello? Yeah. Somebody's listening. I heard a snore over here and a hello over there. I like this one better. Think about this. He says, first of all, you got to put those gods away. Then you got to clean up. And then you got, why? Because where we're going, you're not appropriately dressed. I love that. You know, in order to go back to God, we got to, this can't be acceptable. You can't go back like that. You ever go try to go into a sporting venue, and I mean a major one, and you've got your pocket knife in your pocket, and you've got a couple of bottled waters in your purse, or whatever you carry, and it's against the rules, and you try to go through the, 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 the detector, and it gets your knife, and they look through, the, and they're going to say to you, you can either go in and leave that stuff out, or not come in. You ever been stuck there? You've ever had to lose a whole bottle of water, throw it away because I didn't see that. Or, or you had something, you just can't go in with that nice pocket knife and it's either go back to the car and leave it behind or chunk it. You can't go in this way. And I'm going to tell you this. When you come close to God, there's some things you can't bring with you. There's some things you've got to wash your hands of. There's some clothes that got to be changed because that's inappropriate. 
for where you're going. And here's why it's that way. When you come to Baal, and this is why they couldn't make up their mind between Baal and God. If you come to Baal, you can bring God with you and you can bring all these other gods you want to. You can bring whatever you want to. I'll accept you just the way you are with all the other stuff. And you can come. And they liked all that. And when you come to God, you couldn't bring any of it. You can't bring Baal with you. It's either God or nothing else. I'm exclusive. I'm jealous. I own you. I will not let you have this other crud that destroys your life. Everybody else will let you have it because you made their God, that God in your image. But when you come to God, it's just me. And you leave everything else behind. And there's no apologies and God doesn't seem to think that he owes you anything. You got to leave some stuff behind. One more thing, and it sounds weird, verse 9. It doesn't sound fun at all, and I think our young people uh, demand everything at church be fun. And we're training them badly that way. <laughs> Cleanse your hands, he says, and then verse 9, be wretched. I want you to mourn. I want you to weep. I want you to quit your laughing. I want to quit your, oh, I'm having a great time and jumping up with joy. I want you to have gloom. I want you to have sorrow. I want you to have a broken heart. And you're like, what kind of verse is this? Because submission to God is painful. Submission to God has those moments where you can't do this and it breaks your heart. And what you've been doing has been violating the nature of God and it's breaking his heart. And he wants you to think of those things the same way he does. And he says some of the things you've been involved with are awful, awful things. And you've got to have a broken heart about these things. You realize what God wanted. I think about Josiah, the king, who discovers in his repair of the temple the, law, the book of the law of the Lord. He finally founds this book, finds this book that's been lost for I don't know how long, and, and, and he has him read it. And he's sitting back here, and I, I, I envision him reading this with great joy and delight about what God wants and all this. But as he's, as he's hearing it read aloud to him, his face contorts. He, he has horrible sorrow and a broken heart and he's devastated and his heart rate gets high and suddenly he tears his clothes and he puts sackcloth and ashes on and, and everybody's going, what's wrong with you? He said, are you listening to these words? This is what God wants and this is how we're living. We haven't been given God what he's asked of us. Oh my goodness, my life is a mess and he starts having a broken heart and God loves it. God loves it because sometimes when you read the word, it's not fun, church. Sometimes when you read the word it, it used, dawns on you that something you've been doing is breaking the heart of God and you can't just well that ain't no big deal my bad sorry I'll try to work on this it should break your heart I'm tired of seeing the fun and the partying all the time I need to see some repentance sometimes and broken heartedness you bring your two kids I can see Tommy having to do this once in a while can't imagine which one it is, but just picture the son and the daughter. Just picture it. And one of them has hit the other one. Can you guess which one? It's the son, obviously. So his son hits his daughter for no reason at all, because she's an angel. We all know it's true. And so he brings him up here and he says, son, you're going to have to, you're going to have to apologize to Rosalind now. I'm so sorry, sister. Okay, now, how many think that was uh, sincere? You can't read his heart. You don't know what's in his heart, can you? Yes, you can. That wasn't sincere. That's terrible. You're going to have to do this again, and we're going to keep apologizing until I think you mean it. You could fake it if you want to, but it's got to look like you mean it. An apology needs to look like you mean it. And God says, you know what? When you come to a knowledge of something that you've done has broken the heart of God, He wants to see what is called remorse, a broken heart. Listen to Psalm 51 and what David summarizes. He says, you know, uh, I've, I've committed adultery with Bathsheba. I've killed her husband. I've kept it hidden for all these years. I've broken the heart of God. And he says, I would have offered every animal I had in my flock if that's what it's going to take. I'd give him every sacrifice I could possibly muster from my possessions. But that's not what God wants. Even in the Old Testament, that's not what God wants for you. Will not delight in sacrifice or I will 
would give it. You wouldn't be pleased. You wouldn't be pleased with a burnt offering. I'd give it too. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. I finally come to a realization of what he wants. A broken and contrite heart, oh God, you will not despise. He wants to see you mean it. He wants to see conviction and a care. Not just a knowledge of, but a care about the things of God. It's one thing to go forward sometimes. It's another thing to go, go forward with a contrite heart. So it's... Paul's able to say in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 what godly sorrow looks like. It's an earnestness to get it fixed. And I don't care who knows. I don't care who finds out. I want this fixed. I've got to have this right because I can't live with this anymore. An eagerness to get it cleared up. An indignation. I'm so angry that I could have made myself do this. I'm so alarmed that I didn't recognize it as it was happening. I'm so desiring and longing to make it as right as possible and a zeal to get back to being right. That's called God sorrow. It's called conviction. Don't come up to God and say, well, it's my bad. Casually acknowledge it. Let him see conviction. Do you know why there's Kleenex on the front pew? It's not seasonal either. Don't say it's because of allergies because that's here all the time. Because very often when people come to a knowledge of truth, what God wants and what they've been offering him, they are devastated. Their hearts are broken and the tears flow. It's hard, but I'm telling you it's rewarding. And here's why. Because he says, if you will submit to God and resist the devil, the devil will flee from you. If you will do what God says, if you'll submit to his word, his word is unique. It's different. It's a spiritual thing. We're fighting a spiritual battle against Satan, and often we use our physical world wisdom to try to fight it. We try to use common sense in our regular world to fight Satan in the spiritual realm, and that just doesn't work. But God, in His great wisdom, wrote Scripture to us to help us fend off the spiritual battle. And if we'll just listen to what He says, sometimes we run like Joseph did. Sometimes we memorize Scripture in the area of our weakness, and we wield that sword and cut that thing the pieces, right? Or, or sometimes we are smart enough to know that there's sin over there and I just don't go there. Scripture tells you that it knows you better than you do. The way I compare this is that you ever been to play laser tag? Laser tag has, you have this gun that's unlike any other gun because it's supposed to be read by the laser thing that the person's wearing on their chest. The frustration I have with laser tag is I know that I shot him and it says I didn't. I know I hit him right between the eyes, kindly and brotherly love, but I did. It doesn't register at all. It acts like I missed. You know what I want to do? I want to take a pellet gun when I go in. And I want to go in here and I decide, okay, you guys play laser tag. And if it sounds up, I've got you. But you'll know when I shoot you. You'll know it because that pellet will hit you right where I aim it. Because it registers every time. Here's the thing. You, you don't use a pellet gun in laser tag. It's got a different kind of rule in place. And I'm telling you, we're facing Satan in the spiritual battle. We're using too much worldly wisdom wisdom to try to fight a spiritual battle. And God says, what I want you to do is just take my word for it. I know better than you do. Submit to my word because you don't have what it takes to defeat him. And I think he's right. My experience is he's right. And my wisdom and my efforts and my schemes just don't work. I just need to submit and do exactly what he tells me because it's a different kind of battle. And he says, if you do, you will resist the devil. Notice something else, that when you draw near to him, God will then come drawing near to you. It triggers God's response. I told you, and it's true. Submission, the first step is from you. You're obligated to make that first step, but I didn't say you had to make them all. You have to make that first step, but when you start coming, he starts running too. Prodigal son, isn't that what happens? Now, he's not going to come after you in far country to get you kicking and screaming on the way back. But as soon as he sees you from the front porch, he's taken out after you. You're not making that walk alone. He's going to join you, but he's just got to know that it's your choice. It's your will. You've got to demonstrate your will, and then he shows his. And his is there all along. Now, here's what's interesting. What drove the boy away? The nature of his father drove the boy away. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of all this stuff you preach and the rules that you have. 
I want you dead. You're dead to me. Give me the money and I'll go. And so the, the nature of the father drove him away. But guess what drew him back? That very same nature drew him back. He began to say to himself while he's wanting this pit, while his mouth waters for pig food, he says, you know what my dad was like? The father has not changed. The father never changed. And because he didn't, the son knew what was, uh, what was waiting for him. And the same thing that repelled him attracted him. The same thing that drew him away caused him to go back. I know what my father's going to do. He's going to let me stay on as a servant. And he's going to love me that way. I know enough about him to know this. Here's the thing the, 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 for us as the church. What we need to be doing is teaching the truth. And there will be points in time for our young people when that truth makes them annoyed with us. And that truth makes them go away. But we do not change the truth in that response to that because that same truth is going to bring them home. That same truth is going to draw them back. They need to know what's here. We need to teach it lovingly. But I'm going to tell you this. When these people say, our kids are leaving, what do we need to do? We need to change stuff. No, no. They know what they're coming back to. The Father will bring them back. The Father's nature will draw them back. The thing that's hurting is them, not the truth. They're not walking away because of the truth. They're walking away because of their sin. And they need to know what they'll find when they come back. And they need to know that the Father didn't change while they were gone. The truth needs to be taught in the church. And when people don't like it, we need to let them leave. And while they're gone, we need to continue teaching it. And when they come to their senses, they need to know when they come back that they'll find what they left. Because the thing that repelled them is eventually going to attract them back. I believe that with all my heart. Keep preaching that truth. Now the interesting thing is, I don't know what you've done, and this church doesn't know what you've done. There may be people in this room that you could make me blush with the things that you've done, or the things that you've thought, or the things that you've engaged in. I don't know what you've done, but I do know this. I know how God will respond when you come back. This church doesn't know what you've done and what you'll have to repent of. I have no idea. But this church knows what God will do when you come back, don't we? Don't we, church? We know exactly what he'll do when you decide to come back and you say with your lips what you've done. And it may make us blush and it make us, oh my goodness, I can't believe it. But I know what God will do. As soon as you come down, he will start running to you. I know that's what he'll do. And he'll forgive you of your sin. I know that's what he'll do. And you do too, because that's what draws you back. The same thing that ran you off. Last thing is that it's going to bring more grace into your life. God opposes, uh, verse 6, God opposes the proud, gives grace to the humble. And then verse 10, humble yourselves before the Lord and He will exalt you. It goes something like this. And for those of you who are, have college students or ever have had, it goes like this. I want you to think, uh, Mac Ramsey and his wife decide... This is not an announcement. This is an illustration. Mac, Mac and Judy decide they're going to give personally $5,000 to every CRA graduate who goes to college. Again, this is not an announcement. This is an illustration. All you have to do is answer three simple questions and fill out a 300-word essay. And it doesn't matter what it sounds like. They don't care. You just got to fill this thing out. And as soon as you fill it out and turn it in, they give you a $5,000 check. Why in the world wouldn't you do it? Can you think of any reason why somebody would refuse that? What God says here is this. I've got a whole abundance of grace. I'm willing to give you extra. The more you'll submit yourself, the more I will issue to you. And you're going to say, well, humble, humbling myself is hard and submitting to what you want. Yeah, I grant that. But there is an absolute scholarship of grace coming to you when you do it. It's not like you get nothing out of it. The more you humble yourself, the more grace he gives. How many in here could use a little more grace? Well, then humble yourself. Find those areas of your life where you haven't submitted yet and submit to him. And I'm telling you, what he says is, this is a guarantee This is not one of those, well, maybe. You'll get more grace. We're going to finish not with Simon says. That's a game. We're going to finish with God says. If you want to experience a little more grace, God says, humble yourself. Submit. If you want to draw close, you want God to draw closer to you, then you draw near to him, God says. 
you want Satan to be defeated more in your life, God says, submit to me and resist him. If you want more wisdom, God says, ask me for it. If you want to look more like Jesus, God says, hear the truth and do it. If you want to be saved and stay saved, God says, show me your faith by your works. And if you want to be a friend of God, submit to him. It's really simple. If you're coming to God for the first time this morning, the answer is you need to submit to him. And if you've been God's for a long time but drifted away and you want to know how to come back, well, the answer is submit to him. Do what he says. And if you're subject to that invitation, it's open now as we stand and sing to encourage you. All to Jesus.